Hey everyone, I'm Scott Cunningham, aka Sconcy Business, and today we're here with Yuri Klarman. Hopefully I got that correct. He is the CEO and co-founder of Blocks Route, and we're going to be diving into what that's all about today. So just before we get into that, would you like to give a little introduction about yourself? Sure. Um, first, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Yuri Klarman, as you said, um, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Blocks Route. Um, before being a crypto guy, I'm actually a networking guy. So I did my PhD at Northwestern University. And, you know, doing networking stuff. So, you know, routers and Wi-Fi and security. And somewhere in the middle of my PhD, me and my then advisor, now co-founder, Professor Alex Kuzmanovich, realized that, hold on, we discovered something super significant in how the network of blockchain network works. So that led us into diving deeper and nowadays to blocks route. So I am a crypto guy, but first, at heart, before anything else, I'm actually a networking guy. That's awesome. That's awesome. I actually uh, went to school for networking and IT security for four years. Really? Yeah, before I uh, graduated and then I got into social media and then I went into blockchain. So yeah, that's that that small world. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, so when did you actually get into crypto and blockchain originally? So I think like most people that are like, yes, I've heard of it for like 2013, people started to really talk about it and you start to hearing about stuff. But then, like, oh, there's a thing. And I didn't get deep at that. Like I knew it existed. I knew a bit about it. Um, I think in 2016 is when I re really started to dive deeper into it. So um, at least at least I can say it was before 2017 and everybody that joined then, but not too long before that. And again, it's like I actually had a networking research paper that was we were pivoting it into something else. I had a really cool system working. I said, oh, you know what? We can build a network based blockchain system around it. So I kind of like got to it from the research perspective and then, you know, started to learning more about blockchain. But hold on, there's this thing, there's that thing. And then, you know, all of a sudden you spend all your day on Reddit and reading all the stuff like back in the day when Reddit was the thing before crypto Twitter became the thing in Telegram. And so kind of like, you know, for a while there, I think I went really, really deep. Like, oh, I don't need anything else in my life for a while now because I'm just like obsessed about Bitcoin and crypto like 99.5% of the time. And, you know, yeah. at some point you take slightly a step back and manage to balance real life and crypto. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's good that you got in before the uh, big crash. That's unfortunately right when I got in. <laughs> yeah, I got in basically like November 2017 is when I started investing. So yeah. uh, I realized I was not the greatest investor uh, after that. But that's when I started to dive into the social side of things. And that's sort of how everything started for me. So can you give us a brief introduction for what Blocks Route is for people who aren't aware? Sure. So we're called Blocks Route because we help blocks route. Okay. Like blockchains have nodes and they have miners and they send blocks to one another. And our technology is really focusing on allowing blocks to propagate faster and doing bigger blocks and processing more. And it brings a question, why the hell do you need a company to help propagate blocks? Blocks propagate just fine as is. Well, it turns out, and I'm not going to dive too deep about it, and I think in this conversation, because we can spend way too much time on that. But everybody are talking about the scalability problem of blockchain. They said like scalability, scalability, like discussion that started at 2014, I believe. And most people don't understand what the scalability bottleneck actually is. People say, oh, well, if we do a lot of transactions, well, there's a problem of processing. My node that I run on my computer won't be able to handle so many transactions. Well, it turns out that your home computer can easily process 3,000 transactions right now, like, like without like per second, without blinking. And if you have like Intel's latest like i9, you can do 20,000 transactions per second. Processing isn't an issue at all. And then you have other people arguing, well, well if, if it's not the processing, it's the storage. If we'll create really large blocks, you'll have to store them like on your computer and that's going to take a lot of space. But first of all, storage is like dirt cheap. It's super, super cheap. You can easily like you can spend a, if you run a node and you have a computer that it doesn't cost much to add a few terabytes of hard disk to store of that. But even if you're that resource constraint that you can't afford that, 
Well, when you're following what's happening on the blockchain, you don't actually need to store all the blocks since Genesis. It serves no purpose. You need to know what's the current state, right? Who holds how much, how, what's the state of each smart contract or something. And you yeah. need like, let's say like the last 10 blocks or 50 blocks or 100 blocks. But why do you need everything like since the beginning of time? So there are a lot of misconceptions around it, but there is actually a scalability bottleneck at the network layer. The thing is that, and maybe, I, I think most of your audience would be very familiar with it, but the way blockchains work is that people make transactions, right? I want to send you one ETH or one BTC or whatnot. Then I create a transaction and I send it to the entire network. And in the network, you have either validators in POS systems or miners in POW system, but one and the same. They hear all these transactions and they try to aggregate them into blocks, right? So like the block is just a long list of transactions and they try hash numbers or get enough signatures and send that block to everybody else. But the key here, the really limiting factor, the bottleneck is that in order to add the next block to the blockchain, you first need to have the previous one, right? You can't add the next block before hearing the previous one because you don't know which transactions are valid, right? You need to know which transactions happen, right? Maybe I sent all my ETH already to somebody else. So this transaction trying to send you one ETH is invalid. I need to know what's the current state. And that is important because if you take a blockchain, any blockchain, POW, POS, Hashgraph and Dera, or Beacon, like all of them, doesn't matter. All of them, when some, if, if you try to scale it by something small, let's say 100x, okay, not 1,000x, not 10,000, just 100x, do a few hundred transactions per second, then, well, now each block includes 100 times more transactions. So the block is 100 times bigger. If I am the miner and I need to send, I added this block and I need to send it to you, I send 100 times more data, it takes me 100 mm. times longer. Okay, so it takes 100 longer times longer for the block to propagate and reach everybody. So the time between you can add the next block also increases by a factor of 100. So you can do 100 times larger blocks, but the frequency, the rate at which you produce blocks decreases by a factor of 100. So you're back to square one, doing 100 times larger blocks, 100 times less frequently. And that's kind of like what we do, like, like our technology, and we can dive into exactly how we do it, allows for blocks to propagate extremely fast, even if they are bigger. And this is a bottleneck that needs solving. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, I. Maybe we'll break it down a little bit so that everyone, uh, you know, at varying levels of uh, of understanding can can really grasp it. But like before we re really get into the meat of it, uh, let's sort of touch on some of the um, the higher level things. Like what problem does it really set out to solve? So from our perspective, we built a technology that is provably neutral that allows blockchain to scale. So we really just we offer this technology for all blockchains practically for free. This is not how we're planning or making money. And we say, well, you guys can now scale. We remove the scalability bottleneck for all of you. And now blockchains can actually compete in creating real value for real people in the real world. Right? It's kind of like, we'll allow you now compete. Now try to actually make something. Let's make crypto rather than a speculative tool, something that people actually use in reality. So the problem we set out to solve is oh, how can we allow blocks to propagate extremely fast and allow blockchains to scale? That's not actually our business model. That's the problem we solve. Our business model is like, oh, while doing it, we can now offer services to people. Now we're focused strongly on DeFi traders, et cetera. Because we propagate transactions and we propagate blocks and we make everything like we're at the network layer and we're very well connected, then we offer services, oh, if you send your transaction through us, also send it regular way, but you can give it to us, we'll send it faster to everybody else. It reaches the miner faster. It increases your chance of your transaction getting in the next block, assuming you pay enough gas or fee, depending on the blockchain. So we mm. have all sorts of services that allow DeFi traders as like is one example that, oh, when you're making, like 
if you see an arbitrage opportunity or a liquidation opportunity and you want to grasp that and say, oh, I need this transaction in the next block. If it isn't, somebody else is going either to capture it or I'm going to be out bidding or I'm going to have to bid my gas price super high and lose a lot of the value. So if I identify, if I'm a DeFi trader and I identify an opportunity, I want my block, my transaction to go there extremely fast. So that's one of the services that we offer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, like I, I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, especially with like Ethereum and the gas price being so high, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are dealing with those issues around congestion, especially for more amateur traders who might not uh, be aware at, like as to what's the issue around a lot of these things and why so things are so congested. It's, it's not even about being an amateur, okay? We, I have a call in two days, okay, with some trading firm and i'm going to think with somebody who's anything but unprofessional like, like he's like high like even the pros thinks like he's a pro okay like somebody is super good it's like okay he knows everything regarding the trading really well and he understands the technology well enough to utilize it but he's not a networking expert that like focuses on blockchain you can't capture it all if you're do if you're me okay if you're networking expert in the blockchain space you don't know how to trade. Like if you said, oh, you made like terrible mistakes. <laughs> I, you know how much money I, my wife is like three rooms that way. And I just hope she doesn't hear how much money I lost, like <laughs> by pay, bad trading, et cetera, right? Each yeah. has its pros and cons. Like we focus on doing something. And if we solve this problem for others, they can focus on what they do better than other people, right? A trader is better at trading, not at understanding the congestion and oh, how we can reduce the fees and all the stuff around that. Um, speaking of which, though, um, and Ethereum specifically, we like we're working with all blockchains, but we focus very strongly on Ethereum because it has the strongest momentum. It has the largest community of definitely the DeFi space, and so, um, um, just what a week ago or a week and a half ago, the miners increased the gas limit. It means they increase the capacity of the blocks. And this is for the second time in the last nine months. So um, nine months ago, before September 2019, it was at 8 million gas. Then they increased to 10 million gas. And now they increased it to 12. They say 12 and a half million gas. Currently, it's like still moving around 12 million gas. But that's twice in the last nine months when, since we started working with them. In the prior two years, the gas limit was actually stagnant. So like we're... Since we started working with the pools and the miners and removing the scalability bottleneck, the capacity of Ethereum just increased from 8 million gas to 12 million gas. That's a significant boost. It's not our end game in any means at all, but I feel we were already making a significant kind of like impression on a big dent in what's happening in the Ethereum and, and scalability of Ethereum. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So, um, has the company been at all affected by the virus and the lockdown? Has anything changed because of that? So yes and no. Like we're not affected directly. It doesn't affect our revenues and like which customers you have and people using us. Um, our general business model is again in, in the DeFi. Like we'll allow you to make a lot more money. We'll capture a bit of that. And so you're happy and we're happy. And that still works regardless of the virus. Um, mm -hmm. It did change the macroeconomic space. So we're quite a bit like we're a team of um, like something like 20 people. So our, our costs are fairly high. We're running like a complete infrastructure around it and all these kind of things. So the fact that the macro environment change change for us and like oh hold on what do we want to do nobody knows especially at the beginning everything was a lot more scary at the beginning who knows what's going to happen two years down the like maybe we're going to a downturn and everything like we won't be able to raise funds nobody will be able to raise funds at all crypto is going to go back down bitcoin going back to three thousand etc so we took very um cautious steps internally in restructuring and making sure we're very, very efficient. We actually reduced everybody, including myself. We all reduced our, our salaries in a significant way just to make sure, OK, we have a decent like a few millions of dollars in the bank. We're really OK. We're not nowhere close. Like we have a long runway. But in such uncertainty, then on that front, it was it 
it changed i think it changed our mental like perspective on it and like oh it's not just like oh everything's going to be fine whatever we're so we're on a roll everything is going to work maybe the world is might come crashing and we want to make sure that we can endure it um mm. so that's one aspect also we moved to remote working like the entire team is so we have a small satellite office in israel with four developers there but he the, the rest of the team is here in chicago and i am a very big believer in in office working versus remote working, I think that the team needs to be able to communicate with one another. And you know, if you have a question, you pop your head to the next office and you ask, like, "Oh, how did you solve that thing?" And it's a lot easier than you know sending an email and chatting with it. So mm -hmm. changing to remote was a bit scary for me. Like, are we? How do we feel about that? But the team had been great. Like so far, I think because the team already really formed and was very like like, um, like very well connected internally then the fact that we moved to being remote isn't such a big deal. Bringing more, like I am still concerned, like bringing more people and get them on board and kind of like on ramping them, I think is going to be more challenging in this setup because they don't know all the other people. They don't, you don't have that interpersonal connection yet. Um, so that's how we were affected. Not in a major way, but I think it affects everybody. So us too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense to me. So, um, we talked about how the company got its name. What are some of the updates in the future that are uh, in the works right now or set to release soon? So we're actually, so all my talk, all my talk about the DeFi is something that literally we're going to release next week. So right okay. now we, we already have, you know, um, um, friendly customers that we already know. Some of them fairly big, which we like, we offer, we offer a few services that allows trader, really traders to make more money, or like put it simply. Um, when you're trading in DeFi, you have two things that you want. You want to see transaction faster and block. You want to know what this situation faster. And you want, when you make a trade, you want it out super fast. This is extra true or especially true for like liquidity providers. They were liquidity providers. Most of what they do is actually canceling order. Okay, they have something and the market changed. They're being paid just to, you know, provide liquidity. But when the market changed, they don't want to be caught off guard and kind of like out there because they could get destroyed at really high, like really high amounts. So for them, when they send a transaction, um, for that to go faster to the pools and the miners is very, very significant. Um, so. For people who don't really know how the entire process works, let's say I'm a liquidity provider and I want to cancel an order. Well, I send that, it goes to either Impura or Alchemy or whatever infrastructure I'm using. It goes through their nodes and it propagates to other nodes and eventually it reaches one of the pool nodes who then after a bit of time, when it decides, it creates a new block template. It decides like, oh, we're going to create this block and it continuously updates. And then he tells that to, to the miners, okay? Those who are connected to the pools who, tr who try to mine that block. However, if it takes you a second, okay? For you to send the transaction, to go to Infura, to go to the other nodes. So during this second, there is a 10% chance that the block would be mined by somebody in the system. So during the propagation time is time that you're missing out. If it takes you a second, there's a 10% chance that your transaction won't be in the next block because it didn't reach the pools in order to be in the next block. So, mm -hmm. and if it's a hundred millisecond that you're saving, well, that's 1%. So it's very, like, it's very easy to see like, like, like the value and to measure the value there. So one thing that we offer is to just, we're well connected with what? Something like 70% of the Ethereum hash power. We have many pools connected to us and we just like, we propagate we, just like anybody else, but we're just connected better. So sending it out fast is one thing that we do. Also, one of our friendly traders did some measurement and he compared when he, he runs a node and when he hear transaction and blocks coming from blocks route, sometimes he takes like, it's like he get it like one second or two second or three second, which is in, like, in terms of networking, this is eternity. Okay, three seconds is like a quarter of the time between blocks. 25% of the blocks are being mined during this time. So it takes seconds longer to hear it from other sources, like 
like these infrastructure companies versus getting it from Blockstar. So these are the two things that we offer um, um, DeFi traders, and that's coming out next week. We offer like a transaction screen. People who do like machine learning and identify, oh, what's happening? Oh, this guy made a trade. I should do a trade, or, or even without the machine le learning piece, just see, oh, this whale just sent like, I, this trade is happening. I want to beat it. I want to do this. I want to do that. So we have this super optimized transaction stream feature that you can hear of the transactions as they happen in real time, where you're going to get it really, really fast. So these are kind of like a few things up, up our sleeve really coming out next week. Awesome. Awesome. So would you say that your like main target demographic is people who are actively trading then, uh, you know, anywhere from like beginner to more intermediate traders? Like what, what exactly would that be? So it, uh, I would say it's between beginner and, you know, trading hedge funds. Okay. Like, like it's not for tr like, the really big ones, the really good ones, we're working with them directly and we're getting feedback from them. So I know for a fact mm -hmm. that they're interested as well. Some of, some of the features that we provide, they specifically ask, they say, oh, can we get this? This would be valuable. So it really is, and again, going back to your question, like I'm going back to your question about people knowing and not knowing, even really professional traders don't really know and understand a lot of the things happening. And so mm -hmm. we're working with, any level of DeFi trader. And this is very specific for DeFi. If you're just on centralized exchanges, well, you're connected, you have APIs, you see what's going on. You don't have this network propagation latency thing that happens and really affect. And when you send an order, it just gets there, right? So this is not targeted for those who just do centralized exchanges. But those who also do DeFi, they might not understand it, but if they hear about transaction faster, they make more money. If they hear about blocks faster, they make more money. And when they send transaction faster, they make more money. These are opportunities that they will miss out. And it's quite a lot. Like it is very possible for a trader to be missing 10% of his trade because by the time it reaches the pools and getting people to mine on it, well, a block was already mined during this time while it was like on the way there. So I, we're focusing very strongly on miners, on, uh, sorry, on DeFi traders on that front. Um, we are focusing strongly with miners and pools, but not as customers really. We're working with them to improve the, the networking layer and allow them to scale because this is what we want for them. This is what we want for us. It's part of the business model. And we also have a few longer term plans on, we really want to allow everybody to make like really fast, cheap, reliable transactions. So we're about reducing the fees, allowing transaction to be guaranteed to be included within a few blocks. So if you want a transaction in the next block, send it fast three blocks out and pay a high gas. Like there, there isn't a way to, to like when you're trying to, you know, in a gas auction or something like that. But if you want your transaction out, within or mind, you know, in an hour or two hours or three hours, you don't really need it in the next one, but sometimes it's hard to. So, so we are also working on features regarding that. So we have quite a lot of different segments of the market we're working on, but to DeFi traders is definitely an important one. Awesome. 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 So, um, where do you feel that your company fits in with, other similar companies or how are you uniquely different if you'd like to elaborate so i want to say we're unique but not in like oh everybody else are regular and we're super special not that at all it does like we're doing networking stuff that almost nobody else is doing um about a year after or maybe a year and a half after we started like a company tried to do Oh, what we do, but slightly better. Um, they ruined a few opportunities for us because when we went to and speak and offer collaborations, we got feedback like, oh, we already tried these guys and it was suck and it didn't work well and we don't want to try it at all. And like, mm -hmm. damn it, I hate it. <laughs> these guys really annoy me. But we work at the network layer. Okay, we work underneath the blockchain. If you want a mental model, if you have the blockchain is layer one and transaction happened there and you people think about layer two when they're thinking about scalability, like, you make transactions off-chain and every so often you put them on-chain. 
We're layer zero, okay? We work underneath the blockchain. We're like Comcast or AT. We're a company that allows information to propagate fast, only we're focusing on blockchain. We use the specifics, the specific characteristics of blockchain. Specifically, we keep everybody in sync about transactions so blocks can propagate faster. And we are provably neutral. Part, a big part, and we're not a single point of failure. A big piece of our design is how do you do all of that and even if we go down, even if we go rogue, if something terrible happens, everything continue to operate at scale without us. So we're very uniquely positioned as a networking layer underneath the blockchain. We allow the communication to work faster and so scale blockchain and allow features around it. And working in this space, first, it's hard, right? Plenty of people work in all sorts of like layer two and this way and that way. Not too many people are like networking experts who understand blockchain, like this is a smaller subgroup. It does offer really interesting opportunities. Okay, if you understand that blockchains are two-sided markets. Um, if you think of Uber is a two-sided market, so you have drivers and you have passengers and you need both to come to the platform in order to create value. And Lending Club has borrowers and lenders and you need both, then Blockchains are two-sided markets because you need users, people making transactions on one side, and you need miners or validators on the other side to include them and produce blocks. And so once you understand we're operating in a two-sided market, we're providing this infrastructure really for free to pools and the miners. So they scale. Everybody are happy. This is a pure like net positive thing. We scale blockchains. Everybody should be happy about that because blockchain can now achieve more. Doing mm -hmm. that, now we're like, okay, while well, doing that, what kind of services can we offer? Oh, if we're well connected, if you give us a transaction, they'll get it to them faster. Oh, ah, voila, okay, here, here's one type of business we can do. Oh, we reduced the risk. Blocks no longer has uncles and forts the same way. So we can offer lower fees, okay? Fees that miners require, they, you need to compensate them for including your transaction because you increase their chance of having a fork or an uncle or an orphan. But if you reduce that, now fees can go down as well and all sorts of like very valuable things that come out of it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, so is that other company still doing what they're doing or did they kind of fall off ever since then? I haven't heard of them for at least a year or so. Um, mm. um, I don't think they exist anymore. Honestly, I have so many things on my plate. I don't, I, I don't even have time to like keep track with what's going on. Um, one thing which is I am keeping track of is um, Ethereum's EAP 1559. I don't know if you're familiar with it. The idea is that instead of having a regular fee, now we're, there's, a, there's a suggestion that has a lot of support of people saying instead of having just a single fee and they spike and everything goes terribly, we'll have two pieces of the fee. The base fee which just like everybody pays the same amount. So it's very predictable and you don't have to outcompete with others. And that's supposed to keep the blocks only half full. And so you have room for more and you only have to tip the miners a tad more to include your transaction. So that's something I'm keeping close tabs on because I find it important. I think it's important for fees to be low so DeFi can achieve all the cool things that it wants, right? It's kind of like, this is super great, great. This is super exciting, but only if it works at scale, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if programmable money is not useful if every transaction costs you a dollar or half a dollar or yeah. 10 cents. No, it should be a cent. Yeah, yeah, no, I fully agree. I, I think it's really important for mass adoption too, um, <clears throat> especially with my main focus being on blockchain social media. Um, I've always believed that, you know, I mean, it, there, there's a lot of apps out there that will charge you like per post or I mean, there, there's apps like Twitch that will charge you to change your settings. Right. Um, so, you know, there, there are some pretty ridiculous fees that are attached that I think will um, people won't use those and um, they'll look for ones that are a lot cheaper and or, you know, don't have fees at all or fees that are negligible to the point where they don't notice because, uh, you know, people coming off of regular platforms like Twitter or something will come on and they'll say, okay, well, I'm on a place where it's free or it costs, you know, 
basically nothing. And uh, if I'm going to start paying or, you know, go to something new, there's got to be incentive there. So I think it's really important uh, for people to be trying to get those fees down as much as possible because that will sort of open the way for a lot more adoption through all the other use cases. So that's a use case which I really like. And I always like one, I was speaking with a friend of mine um, last week, I think it was, and we were talking about the idea of what it would mean for platforms like Google and Facebook. What are the alternative if you can allow microtransaction, right? And people talk about, well, if, if on Twitter, if there was a way that it's not, or let, let's take Facebook. Yeah, I think, sorry, it's a better example than, than, than Twitter. Facebook right now monetize like your information and sell it for ads because this is how they make money, right? This is like web 2.0 and that's the model that works. It's not that they're evil. It's not, that's the thing that works and everybody want to use Facebook and they want to use the social, but they have to make money somehow. If you say like, oh, can we, every time you like something, every time you share something, then you send a really tiny, tiny amount to the creator of whatever content that is. And if the platform can take a portion of that value being created, they no longer have any incentive or any need to sell your data, right? Such an ecosystem would be really, really great, but you can't, it's not even about the amount. I think the amount is negligible, but you can't have users thinking at the back of their mind, oh, I just paid money. Like, should I pay, is this worth, a tenth of a cent, not because it's about the money, it's about the mental burden of doing it. That would never, never mm. work. This is why um, Brave Browser, right? I like Brave a lot. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how I feel. Would it be better without the, their own token and just like integration? I want to tip with ETH or with BTC mm. or with BCH or with any, or US dollar or stablecoin or whatnot. But it's a really cool thing. I really like Brave a lot. It's a great product. Um, the question is, can you have like an ecosystem that, oh, it hides this entire thing for me. I'm willing to pay a dollar per year or something like that. And when I click on stuff, I give, I send out microtransaction, but I don't want to be aware of it at all. And yeah. I want to allow like, oh, I'm allowing 10, 10 ads per day or something like that. And that mm -hmm. will send me in exchange. This is a closed ecosystem. Doing that. It will fee, this will pay for all the likes and shares that I do without me selling my data, without everybody taking advantage of everybody, you need an, like the entire ecosystem would be cool and great and work nicely, but you can't have users thinking about making payments. This should be completely hidden away from them where like, okay, the deal is so you will accept if you want like this amount of something like get, get users to receive funds or, they write content, they also get like funds through that, and that pays for the stuff they want to do. That's how I look at it. And I think it's a super interesting and exciting like use case. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I think uh, Brave is doing really amazing stuff with their with their project and they have great adoption and everything to go along with it. And I think, yeah, like as long as blockchain isn't um so obvious like it's more in behind the scenes i think that'll be really important for a lot of people because people get so tripped up in the understanding uh like if i show them this and i say blockchain they're like oh wait but like i don't know what that is explain it explain it's like well i could just show you this thing and it works and it, you don't even see the blockchain it's like no like right. I, what is this explain <laughs> it and it's so confusing but it's like if you just leave that part out and you just show them it, like there's so many blockchain social media platforms that people wouldn't even know that there was blockchain or crypto on it unless you like, like cared about that. Right. So like there's so many platforms where you could use it completely um, without even realizing that there's any crypto or anything like that. I mean, obviously you'll see like a little wallet at the top, but um you wouldn't have to like know or understand anything about that to still use the platform as is. And it's more of just like a bonus rather than something that requires you to understand. And I think that's really, really important for, for mass adoption, for and, just general use of the platform by anyone. And, and I think that's like, I know, I know you're strong on, on the social media blockchain, like, like spec that, but I think that's true for all crypto use cases or blockchain. Yeah, use cases. absolutely. It's kind of like, yeah, 
let, let me tell you guys, nobody cares about your blockchain. Okay, regular people don't even know what a blockchain is, let alone what's the difference between the blockchains, let alone the ethos of the entire thing. Furthermore, privacy per se is like, oh, are you willing to leave all your stuff, like your convenient like platform, etc., and this will preserve your privacy? That's not enough value for like people today to move to something which is even slightly, slightly less comfortable, sleek, and super professional. Okay, like, like it's good. I'm all in favor of privacy, but this would be like, oh, you should get them with something that is valuable and super exciting and mm -hmm. insert all the other stuff like privacy, et cetera, like have that part of the, of the model, but don't think that people would buy in for that. Like some people would, there is a small percentage of people who care deeply about their privacy and mm -hmm. small key percentage of people who care deeply about how your blockchain works and like, oh, are they rewarded this way and that? Yeah, but that's, that's not for real consumer apps to be used by real people. If you want something out there that people use, it would create like something very significant, specific value that you get with that, that you can't get elsewhere. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, because uh, we we can clearly see that with all the people using Facebook and Google, that privacy is uh, is not on the forefront of their uh, concerns. Mind you, I mean it should be, and um, and I value privacy. What, 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 I, mean, it, I think I think people should value privacy, or, and rather have a little bit more awareness in how their privacy is affected in a day-to-day because -day. i think a lot of people just lack the understanding and the knowledge That's about that about like how their privacy is being invaded and what's being sold and what they've agreed to i mean no one's going to read all the uh all the uh terms and agreements of yeah. anything so unfortunately most people are very unaware of what they've oh, agreed to with like, what's oh, going on 800 pages of terms and that, like, like oh do you want to use this browser this browser here uh, voila literally yeah. 800 pages of yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's just have like, if like, uh, ten percent of humanity spend like three years in getting like you know a law degree, and then like you know another two years and kind of like getting deeper into that, and then another two years just <laughs> writing. Like that doesn't make any yeah. sense. Like that's that's not it. But also going back to DeFi, which again is a space which I really like. People call it like the money Legos, etc. Even there, like people are building cool stuff and like I really like the vibe and I really got like a lot of it is very interesting. But for this to be significant on a global scale, then this needs to create financial product that people want to use. OK, not because it's on the blockchain. OK, and I like the incentive mechanism and I like, like, OK, the idea that, oh, we create like a loan. Like you, you can create loans, et cetera, and you incentivize people to liquidate if it's under collateral. Like these are great. I like the mechanics, like all of it. But you should understand that, you know how many very large funds don't do DeFi because they were just too big to do it? Like if they do anything, that like they, they move the, all the needles in all the wrong direction, like too strongly. Even, who was it? I was just before COVID, I think, I, I think, I think it was beginning of March of 2020, but could be February. I don't remember. Um, Token Daily did um, like a like a set. Uh, it's not a session. Like I don't know. Like, like, like um, a a get around for family offices about blockchain and crypto and all these kind of things. And I think the CEO of Arca um, was talking there that we, it's not whether people are willing to accept. Bitcoin, and they're very Bitcoin maximalist, but like we won't hold that against them. They're like, the real large funds, Bitcoin is not ready for them. If they try to step in, they lose like everybody's wet dream about everybody. Oh, the, 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 like the prices go up 10 times, etc. They, they can't enter. They're too big. If they try to say, oh, I'll just put like 10% of 10% of a percent of my of, of our the wealth we manage into BTC that there's not enough BTC like out there to, to, to even allow for that. And so prices mm -hmm. will go nuts. So I think if DeFi wants to be something substantial, really, either they, sh they should be aware of the context. The outside, they have to create financial products that can be actually be used by financial entities, which are not, you know, crypto hedge funds. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I think... 
uh, the more usability, obviously, uh, the more adoption. And you know, it it's a simple it's a simple concept, really. So that's uh, we we've covered most things here. Where do you see uh, blocks route going over the next year? And then you know, I mean, if you can look this far ahead, like the next three or five years. Um, <clears throat> Let's just talk about the ideal use case, since obviously there's so many ways that things could go. Yeah, you mean to say so many things that so many ways that things can go wrong. Um, <laughs> you basically. Um, so let's start with the end goal for a second. Okay, we we took the Bitcoin code, what a year and almost two years now, deployed a Bitcoin network of our own, and we only changed. Just using blockchain and check like how many transactions can Bitcoin, the simplest blockchain, simplest POW, simplest mechanism, code isn't optimized to handle high throughput of transactions. How many transactions can it handle with blocks route? And we saw it was able to peak at 3,000 transactions per second. And that's before the, and, and we can do much more than that. Just the code isn't written, like you have sleep command in there and all sorts of stuff that are not written to handle high throughput that the way blocks are can enable. So going forward, I, I think we're increasing the scalability of ETH so far by, you know, nice percentile, but the interesting part goes through the multipliers. Like I want scalability to go up by a factor of two, by a factor of five per year, okay? Like it should grow and grow and grow. It should grow exponentially before we hit the scalability and bottleneck, you know, from the beginning of ETH until 2016 or so. And then you kind of like, we stagnated there for a while until blocks are like came into town and helped like increase the, the scale of the gas limit of ETH. But looking three years from now or five years from now, like we should be handling thousands and tens of thousands of transactions per second. The end game, 10 years from now, I'm talking 300, 400, thousand transaction per second. Um, literally, DeFi and decentralized exchanges and these kind of things will swallow up any amount of capacity that you'll give them, right? It's like, think of a decentralized exchange, think that it has, let's say, just a thousand traders. Again, Binance has like four million. Okay, If you have a thousand traders and each one isn't doing full-blown algo trading thousand of transaction per second, each one is doing like, let's say, one transaction per second, a bit of arbitrage here and there. That's a thousand TPS for your tiny decks with a thousand traders, each one doing just a tad. There is really demand from the DeFi space that will consume any amount of capacity that you'll give it. Um, so that's like longer term. We're here to scale blockchains. We know we can do it with, with Ethereum, by the way, we were able to sustain at hundreds of transactions per second without changing the code, just enabling higher gas and removing the networking bottleneck. If we're talking about the next year, in the next year or so, I expect a lot more people to hear about us from the user perspective up until now, like pools know about us, miners know about it, because that's what we spent the entire 2019 working on and getting connected and getting everything set up. Now we're going to see in the next year, people saying, oh, I can use Blockshout to improve my DeFi here and there. It's going to be like, everybody knows MetaMask, right? I use it when I trade DeFi. Oh, here's an add-on. We might work directly just with MetaMask, and so you, we hide it from you. We might do channel sales that way as well. But the idea is that blocks route is really all the blocks you're seeing out there are being right now propagated using blocks route. Or, or like you, you don't know it the same way you don't know if it's going on, you know, copper wires or optic fibers. But it's happening like at the network layer. Mm -hmm. um, so in the next year, definitely you're going to a lot of people say, oh yeah, I'm trading and I'm doing like, and I'm using Blockstart for improving my performance. Um, next year or the year after, I expect additional services to really like become important, like guaranteed transaction, cheap transaction, all these kind of things that we can enable by allowing all of that. And again, we're not forcing anybody. We're not playing any like, oh, use it. Nobody ever has to use us, but we oh, sometimes we create value that, oh, if it came from us and it has lower risk, the miners and the pools will be able to accept it at a lower fee and these kind of things. So that's how the next two years look from my perspective. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So that, that, that makes sense to me. And yeah, getting, getting the cost down is always going to be, uh, one of the main things to focus on. And I think you guys are definitely really helping bring the space, uh, progress the space forward. So that's, uh, that's pretty much everything from my end. Um, where can everyone go to learn more about blocks route and, uh, how, where can they follow you? So it's super easy to find blocks. You Google blocks route, you find blocksroute.com and you find us on Twitter. Uh, you spell my name, U R I Uri. So really, if you look for Uri blocks route or Uri block Klarman, there's like, there's just one Uri Klarman in the world. Super easy to find me. Twitter is probably the base spot. Please don't send me LinkedIn messages. Like every so often I have to go in all the like random cold email messaging like through LinkedIn, like that. You want something like reply to me, DM me, like we're, I myself am very like active on social media. You can always like reach out to me, whether that's a collaboration that you're interested, if you have thoughts and like, like really like we're, we're trying to help the crypto ecosystem as a whole. And we're always very open to discussion and thoughts and concerns and suggestions, et cetera. Um, so that, yeah, that and blocks out on Twitter are kind of probably the, the best goals. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, that is everything for me. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to touch on before we end this off? Um, I, di- I don't have anything prepared, but now that I think about it, like all you DeFi traders out there who are listening to us, um, Check us out. Like, I think like we're trying to create a cool product here, which I will help you make more money and make better trades. I will charge you a bit of the extra, but you're getting most of the value here. So that's always how we try to approach business. And this, I think a lot of people would find this interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, elaborating on what Blocks Route is all about. I'm sure people watching uh, will be able to take advantage, especially for people in the DeFi space. So again, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video to the very end. Since you did, make sure to give it a like and comment hashtag number one ham in the comments below. So that way I know that you watched the whole video. Also, please subscribe to this channel and feel free to follow me anywhere under at Scott C business. I'm basically on every platform. You can also share this with someone else who might gain value from it. And that would be very helpful and impactful to helping my channel grow as well. If you'd like to support me more directly, you can also donate to scottcbusiness.eth or scottcbusiness.crypto listed below. Thank you so much for your support and for watching this video. I'm Scott Cunningham, aka Scott C Business, signing off. Cheers. Thank you.